Hello gamers! We just went through what is quite possibly one of the best years for new video games we've ever had. And to celebrate, I want to talk about my favorite games that I played for the first time this last year. Let's get started! Now, there were so many great new games, in fact, that there were tons I would have loved to get around to, but just couldn't find the time for. Therefore, don't expect any of these titles to get mentioned here. I would still like to get to them in the future, though. There were also some games I started in 2023, but didn't get to finish on time, so I won't be featuring them in this video. Maybe next year. Because of all that, though, this video won't just be about my favorite games that came out specifically in 2023. I played and enjoyed plenty of different kinds of games last year. Therefore, I'll be ranking all of the titles that I played and legitimately liked last year. Before getting into that ranking though, I have a few honorable mentions. These are all games I enjoyed to some capacity, but not enough to be included in the official ranking. I'll mention them in alphabetical order. Astro's Playroom was a delightful little gem that served as a solid intro to what the PS5 is all about. I finally bought one of those for our household around Valentine's Day last year, so my wife and I enjoyed playing this cute, breezy platformer together as we got used to the DualSense controller. The only thing really holding this game back from greatness is its length, for I easily could have played this for a lot longer. As it stands, it's just a glorified tech demo, but it made for an easy platinum trophy, so that's a win in my book. I played through Control in anticipation of Alan Wake 2, and while I found it to be pretty dissatisfying from a narrative standpoint, the game more than makes up for those shortcomings with its richly detailed universe, Metroidvania level design, and exciting combat. It's a game that does a lot right, and it proved to be quite rewarding for me as a player who likes to scour every nook and cranny for secrets. But yeah, since it all adds up to a rather lackluster ending, I was more than ready to move on from it as I worked towards earning the Platinum Trophy. And lastly, we played a lot of Uno. What? I like Uno. Sue me. Other than those honorable mentions, I revisited a few games that I had played before, and as such I won't be including them in the ranking. I replayed these two games prior to checking out their sequels, and I revisited The Last of Us when the HBO show premiered. If I hadn't already played Metroid Prime in the past, I would have included the remastered version for the Switch that Shadow dropped nearly a year ago. Needless to say, it's one of the best video games ever made, and is a no-brainer purchase if you own a Switch. With all of that out of the way, let's jump into the official ranking. It's a top 7 list, so we'll start things off with... NUMBER 7! Between the two Call of Duty campaigns I played this last year, I definitely prefer Black Ops. Sure, playing on hardened difficulty had its annoyances in either game, what with the unfair placements of enemy spawns and notorious grenade spam, but this Cold War installment of the story has a lot of advantages over its World War II predecessor. The first one is that the setting itself is just more interesting. Not that I dislike World War II stories, in fact I'm really fascinated by them, but tapping into the potential of secret operations amidst the politically tumultuous 1960s allowed Treyarch to tell an epic story across a whole host of locations. It also allowed for some fun, if perhaps a bit excessive, historical revisionism as the campaign goes from Cuba to Russia and Vietnam from one level to the next. The great variety of environments and weapons kept the game from ever growing stale, which is important for a Call of Duty game since the combat sandbox really isn't that deep. While I think the original Modern Warfare 2 is the most memorable Call of Duty campaign that I've played, Black Ops is a pretty close runner-up. I should also mention that for a game that came out in the middle of the Xbox 360 era, it still looks great today, especially on my laptop which was running it at max settings. Speaking of which, playing both of those Call of Duty campaigns converted me to the belief that shooters are just better with a mouse and keyboard. Heck, even for Halo and the original Star Wars Battlefront 2, which I've been playing religiously on Xbox since before I hit puberty, I now only play those games with mouse and keyboard controls. Thank you for helping me see the light, Call of Duty. Number six. Hot take here, but Tears of the Kingdom is nowhere near the game that Breath of the Wild was. Oh brother, this guy stinks! It is bigger, more ambitious, and a technical marvel, yes, but I do have to say that there is something about the previous game that hit me in such a specific way. I mean, for goodness sake, I wrote a whole video essay about it. To keep things simple for this video, the context for the adventure in Breath of the Wild was very emotionally compelling, for as you regained memories of Princess Zelda and the champions, the more important it became to scour Hyrule for all of its secrets and purge the land of its evil. This time 
time around though, the choice to use the same method of quote unquote discovering the story through memories just didn't work nearly as well. Adjusting to a plot focused story as opposed to a gameplay centric story resulted in a much less effective experience overall, which is why you don't hear people talking about the narrative when they offer praise of the game. I could keep going on about my issues with the game, but I won't for two reasons. For one thing, there's a whole hour long video on my channel you can check out instead. Secondly, it's still ranked number 6 in this video, so clearly the wizards at Nintendo did something right. The game still has the fun gameplay loop that got me hooked in Breath of the Wild, the likes of which was enough to keep me engaged for over 150 hours per playthrough in that game, and 140 hours with Tears of the Kingdom. I cleared all 152 shrines, I activated all of the light routes, maxed out the Zonai charge batteries, completed all of the dungeons, whipped Master Koga into shape, eh, well you get the picture. All of the enhancements to the original gameplay were also welcome, such as the powers granted to Link by Rauru's arm. Ultra Hand, Ascend, and Recall are all incredible achievements of programming magic, and Fuse was a valuable asset in scaling up Link's powers at a conveniently fast rate. On top of all that, Tears of the Kingdom featured some of the most epic moments of any game in the Zelda franchise, such as the Master Sword pull. Despite not hitting quite the same as the landmark title that preceded this one, Tears of the Kingdom was yet another fun addition to the long line of great 3D Zelda adventures. Number five. Over the years, I've come to realize that I greatly appreciate the concept of the roguelike. I love a good challenge, especially knowing that when a game is designed around the idea that each time you die, you learn from your mistakes and have more success on your next go around. This is exactly the case with the gameplay loop and story of Inscription. Well, at least for the first act of the game. I won't say more than that, for I don't want to spoil the deep secrets of this game for those who are unfamiliar. Needless to say though, I never expected to be so engrossed by a card game that wasn't meant to be played in a party setting. Developer Daniel Mullins crafted an experience that uses the medium of video games to its fullest potential, which is helped by the suitably creepy vibes on set by the atmospheric visuals and sound design. Untangling the web that is this game's story all depends on how much the player cares to seek things out for their own, just as they're fighting for their life in the titular card game or trying to solve the escape room puzzles within the wood cabin setting. As the game went on, I will admit that nothing that happens compared to what I experienced in the opening hours, but it still remained fresh and interesting from beginning to end. New mechanics kept being introduced, wrinkles in the story kept coming, and the challenge remained right until the mind-bending conclusion. Certainly this was one of the most creative works of art I experienced in 2023, video games or otherwise, and I think you'd do well to try this one out for yourself. With it being something you can complete within 20 hours or so, it's not that much of a time commitment either. If you like card games such as Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering, or you just appreciate genuinely unique video games, Inscription is an essential game to try out. Number four. I've been playing Mario Kart 8 for several years now, so I'm not necessarily ranking the game itself in this spot. Rather, I'm giving the honor to the DLC that set social media ablaze for nearly two years. After all, the Booster Course Pass is definitely one of the most value-packed expansion packs I've frankly ever seen. How so? Let's do the math, shall we? Well, to put things into perspective, the base game is 60 bucks, and you get 48 racetracks alongside all of the characters and other game modes. Even without the Booster Course Pass, it is a fantastic game with tons of replay value. But when you do add this expansion pack to the equation, you get an additional 48 tracks for $25, which if you're judging value based on how many tracks you get, that's about 50 cents per course. If you already have the tier of Nintendo Switch Online that includes the N64 expansion pack, then this DLC is no additional charge. And man, what a satisfying assemblage of courses this is, the likes of which all feature terrific, fully orchestrated arrangements of nostalgic music tracks. A few of the new courses have have since become some of my absolute favorites across all of Mario Kart, such as Yoshi's Island, Ninja Hideaway, and Squeaky Clean Sprint. Of course, tons of nostalgic tracks from previous Mario Kart games have returned in spectacular glory. Waluigi Pinball, Coconut Mall, Calamari Desert, Maple Treeway, Peach Gardens, Daisy Cruiser, DK Summit, and of course, the very best Rainbow Roads, just to name a few. I may not have been quite as jazzed about the Mario Kart Tour City tracks, but you know who was? My wife! I give 
give the booster course pass a lot of credit for helping her to remember how much she enjoys Mario Kart 8, given that these city tracks intrigued her enough to get me to play multiplayer with her. And who could forget that fan favorite characters like PD Piranha and Funky Kong have finally made it in, along with newcomers like Pauline being great additions to the existing roster. Ultimately, I don't want to come across as a Nintendo shill here, I just know a great deal when I see one. To make a point, I was recently playing Fortnite with my brother and my nephews. I don't really play the game all that much, but considering that I enjoy it enough to keep on playing it with them, I decided to buy the John Wick skin. You know how much it cost me to get the V-Bucks necessary for that? Yeah, it was almost 20 bucks. I love John Wick as much as the next American gamer bro, but I immediately regretted that purchase. As for the booster course pass, that added so much value to a game that I already loved and will continue to love for many more years. More thoughts to come in a video later this year. Number three. As I said earlier, I've really come to understand why shooters are such a hot commodity on PC. No game is further evidence of that than Left 4 Dead 2, which I had a blast playing across many nights with my pals Justin and Jared. This is a game I have played in the past, but my time with Left 4 Dead was practically exclusive to the little time I spent in Howie's Game Shack. Rest in peace, Howie's Game Shack. We junior high gamers will never forget you and the memories we made there. Needless to say, I had only scratched the surface of the game at that period of my life. Fast forward to the end of 2022, and my buddy Justin had his first kid, so nowadays, we get together in person less often than we used to. But thankfully, we all have PCs and use Steam pretty regularly, so we sunk a lot of time into Left 4 Dead 2 this past year. So, my connection to this game is deep, both for the fun times I shared with my close friends, and for the fact that this is just one of the best co-op games ever made. There have been many co-op games made over the years, but few have ever come close to making cooperation as organic and enjoyable as this one has. It's so great that I basically can't imagine playing Left 4 Dead 2 solo. Not to mention that each experience playing a 45 minute to hour long campaign is different given that the AI driven intensity director allows for unique combat encounters on each playthrough. And to top it all off, this remains one of the most popular games on Steam nearly 15 years after its original release. So there have been some awesome mods that we've enjoyed together, such as the Journey to Splash Mountain campaign that turns Disneyland into a zombie butchery. As the years go on, I am sure we'll continue to bond online over some rounds of survivors destroying hordes of zombies. Number two. I think I speak for everyone when I say that 2023 was a pretty lackluster year to be a Star Wars fan, but Jedi Survivor was a tremendous bright spot for those who love having adventures in this galaxy far, far away. Respawn Entertainment deserved the flack they got for releasing this in a practically broken state back in April, especially on PC, which is a shame since that cast a bad shadow on what is otherwise a terrific action game. Jedi Fallen Order already was a very good title in my opinion, but Survivor improves on practically every Every single element to great effect. The world is bigger, but it's more manageable due to a streamlined map, a fast travel system, and a collectible tracker that becomes even more useful as you unlock upgrades to the map over time. The graphics are obviously better, but what's more impressive is that the notorious load times that plagued the original are much more manageable this time around, due to the game utilizing the PS5 solid state drive. Plus, the build I played was less glitchy than Jedi Fallen Order is even to this day. Combat has been deepened with Cal's greater tool set of force abilities and lightsaber stances, with my personal favorites being the slow but deadly cross guard, as well as the versatile combo of a single lightsaber and blaster. Plus, this expands upon the level design principles of the first game by crafting an even more interconnected and traversable Metroidvania-styled environment, which for me, that makes a huge difference since I love those kinds of games. Sure, all of that is well and good, but what do these improvements mean to me on a personal level? Well, this game may be far from perfect, but it's as close to a genuine and labor of love that any Star Wars media in 2023 has come to. This game refines and expands upon the original, but more importantly, it endeavored to genuinely build upon the larger universe. Compared to how other recent Star Wars releases just failed to add anything of substantial value, here comes a game that is full of heart, craftsmanship, and admiration for the source material that it reminded me why I love Star Wars in the first place. It provides that escapism one craves for when they come to Star Wars, and it kept me coming back due to the escalating challenge, near constant set of rewards that come with advancing through the game, and the emotionally resonant story that greatly enriched its cast of characters. Who's to say if a potential third and final game would be an even greater achievement, but regardless of that, I can always fall back on this one. That being said, none of that was enough to surpass what I selected for my number one pick. Ladies and gentlemen, that is... <laughs> Thank you.
That's right, I put two games at the top. When I was trying to decide which one to rank as my number one, I realized that I was judging two excellent games that were both over-the-shoulder third-person shooters, survival horror titles with Metroidvania elements, and both feature mind-bending stories and terrific visuals. Thinking on it more, I recognized the Dead Space remake as the superior offering just from a gameplay standpoint, but Alan Wake 2 is the greater artistic achievement. So, at the end of the day... Well, I figured. What the hell? So there you have it. It's a draw. That being said, I recognize that these are two distinctly different games, so I guess you could say that Dead Space is the best remake of 2023, whereas Alan Wake 2 is the best brand new experience of 2023. At least out of the games I played to completion, I'll talk about Dead Space first. Originally, I wasn't gonna buy the Dead Space remake, since I had been, and I still am, pissed off that EA would have the gall to shutter visceral games, make the claim that single player games are dead, and then announce the remake just a few years later. A remake, if I might add, of an already excellent game that the gutted studio developed. But then the reviews dropped, and I was already wanting to buy a PS5 anyway, so I caved and bought a copy alongside my new console. Go ahead and call me a hypocritical sellout, but I mean, it was hard to resist the allure of a game that promised to improve on perfection. And that's exactly what it did. For any complaints I could have levied against the original game are pretty much gone in this remake. Motive Studios could have gotten away with plastering a fancy new engine over the exact same game from before, but they went the extra mile to either fix problems of the original or enhance the experience. The combat in particular felt so much more satisfying in this game compared to the original, given the tweaked controls and the awesome sandbox provided by the new and greatly improved alternate fire modes for each weapon. That last point is important because some guns were straight up useless in the original Dead Space, but I found a legitimate use out of every weapon in the remake, which made combat more satisfying and varied. Turning Isaac into a spoken protagonist was a controversial choice, but I really appreciated this decision since it gave the character much more agency and it allowed for his part in the story to feel more organic as an engineer fixing up the USG Isimura piece by piece. And it goes without saying that this game is absolutely gorgeous, not only running at a buttery smooth 60 frames per second at all times, but the PS5's SSD cut out load times entirely. I could jump right back into my last save point as soon as I booted the game up, and this upgraded tech also allowed the developers to turn the Ishimura into a Metroidvania-styled semi-open world, which, if you've noticed a trend, I really valued. I may still be mad that Visceral Games was given the short end of the stick, but the quality of this remake softens the blow that I felt all those years ago. This is truly the definitive way to play one of the greatest survival horror games ever made. With that being said, 2023 also gave us another one of the greatest survival horror games ever made, one which I had an even deeper emotional investment in than the Dead Space remake. I already made an entire video talking about my longtime love of the original Alan Wake, but to sum that video up, that game had such a deep, core memory-like impact on me that I would have been absolutely crushed if Alan Wake 2 sucked. The fact that we even got a sequel all these years later is a miracle in and of itself, so I would have been at least grateful to experience it. Thankfully, it seems that director Sam Lake and his team might have known that this game was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity when it got greenlit, so they put every ounce of their blood, sweat, and tears into making the most insane sequel to Alan Wake that they possibly could. Lo and behold, I couldn't have been happier with how it turned out. I knew this was going to be my game of the year just from the Herald of Darkness sequence alone, but the rest of the game offers tons of value as well, for it melds together so many different mediums of storytelling to create something truly special. You get the live-action cutscenes interlaced with gameplay, just like other Remedy titles, but they definitely go harder with that here than they ever had previously, fully committing to the very meta approach to storytelling. Through the collection of manuscript pages scattered across the game world, piecing together the story on Saga Anderson's caseboard and the mind place, Alan Wake shaping his story by literally changing the environment around him, and all of the side stories that all complement this wacky world, the narrative of Alan Wake 2 is easy to sunk one's teeth into for 20 to 25 hours. It helps that it features breathtaking visuals that take great advantage of modern hardware, inspired art direction, and above all else, satisfying gameplay. Combat may not be anywhere near the draw that it was for Dead Space, but it works well enough to be a means to an end. Besides, using the flare gun and crossbow were always satisfying, and there were some awesome encounters like the standoff at Cauldron Lake. However, it's the overall horrific journey that Remedy takes the player on which provides great thrill, for the effective combination of combat and 
and once again, Metroidvania-like exploration, side quests, and meaningful collectibles kept the adventure from growing stale. Quite the opposite, in fact, for Alan Wake 2 always had a reason to keep me invested, whether the activity was to deepen the already complex story or give a rich reward to the player. The 13-year wait for this sequel was agonizing to say the least, but the great undertaking that led to this game's development and vast improvements over the original left me completely satisfied. There is bias here, I will admit, but I can't deny that this is a stellar achievement of artistic expression that also serves as a great video game, which I would have felt regardless of my attachment to the original. And that is why I love Alan Wake 2 and the Dead Space remake enough to be my favorite games of 2023. And that's it! Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed what you saw, since that really does help my channel, and I will see you all in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.